Hello, everybody, and welcome to the special bonus edition of the Human Echoes podcast. I'm Albert Berg. I'm Tony Southcott. We are taking on the brand spanking new DC movie, Suicide Squad. Which has been going through the ringer this week on Rotten Tomatoes. I went into this, like, uh, with expectations very low. Although, to be fair, I went into Batman v Superman with expectations very low. I had a lot more fun with this one than with Batman v Superman, Tony. Yeah, it was kind of a movie designed to be a lot more fun. Like they they had their serious moments and they had all that, but they they like David Ayer decided that it was okay that a movie about fantastic humans could have a little humor in it. Yeah, they didn't have to be they didn't have to go into like some weird deep deconstruction about why the sword traps the souls or, you know what, like they just sort of like throw these people at you and they're like, here you go. That, that the, there's a person who has a sword that traps souls in this movie. FYI. Supposedly. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> they just, that, that's almost one of the problems is they spend, I think a little like they, they have that where they're just throwing these things at you and saying, all right, here you are. Hope you accept it. And yet they spend so much time setting all these people up in the beginning of the movie. It feels yeah, like a weird like clip show. 20 minutes or so basically filming a music video for each individual <laughs> Suicide Squad member. I that's I turned to my wife to, in the theater and I said, when is the like, what's up with the weird playlist that this movie is turning into? I mean, this is like <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy, but it doesn't fit as well. They're just like, oh, here's a character. We're going to play music for him. And before we go any further, like this is going to be kind of a spoiler cast. I think we're good. Like we're not going to outright reveal everything, but if you really want to see this movie, like this is the time to hit pause. And if you really want to see this movie, I would say I can recommend this movie in a weird way. There's this movie is not good in a sort of uh, intellectual sense. Tony, as, as a person who, analyzes movies who thinks about movies on stories a lot. I can point out all kinds of flaws. I can look at the rotten tomatoes ratings on this movie and see all the things people pointed out and say, yep, those are definitely problems. But for me though, they didn't ruin the movie that it, that it got a little samey samey towards the end. I felt like by the end I, I was just sort of gliding along. There wasn't like anything that I was like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> but it, it I, I, go ahead. I felt like it kind of threatened at moments to ruin the movie. And then they'd have something that would kind of slow it down and kind of give you a moment to, to really relish in what was happening. But if you think so. about what happens in the movie, there are two parts to the movie. There's the part where they introduce everybody and that takes way too long. And then there's the part where they go fight stuff and that's it. They just keep fighting stuff until the end of the movie. And it, there's not much structure. There's not like, mu- like a lot of twists and turns. There's the one person that they find in the, the building that's kind of a reveal. But this is a movie that works purely on the way that these actors portray their characters. The characters themselves aren't even that well written. And I think I was thinking about this a lot. It, it took me a while to get to sleep last night uh, for whatever reason. It wasn't like. I had insomnia, but I just, sometimes your brain sits there and ticking over. And I kept thinking about Captain Boomerang. And to me, Captain Boomerang (laughs) represents this movie. Like he is like, if you took one character out and said, this is the character that fills in for this movie, that's what he would be because he makes zero sense. Like there's no reason for him to be there. His like his powers are silly. His like he doesn't his, even really use a boomerang very often. Like he uses them to stab people. Right. And he's his <laughs> like his character doesn't make any sense. He's got like he just disappears in one scene and then shows back up and he's like, I'm here again. Great. They like they don't they don't give him any kind of motivation or depth or anything. And yet watching Captain Boomerang on the screen was one of my favorite things about this movie. I could not get enough of Captain Boomerang. <laughs> I love they that guy. Him, like they used him at the perfect amount. Maybe you could have sprinkled in a little bit more, but that might have broken the facade a little bit. Well, and there's other characters too that have. I mean, Harley Quinn. I think is probably the best developed character in this movie, and which is weird to say because she's crazy. Yeah. Like that's her whole shtick is that she's just insane. But they they do a really great job of layering in the perfect amount of humanity underneath of her craziness just to give you that sense that there, this is a real person um, who is very dangerous and very unhinged. And yet 
at, at the at her core, she's not completely inhuman. There's enough there for you to identify with. Yeah, there's just enough fragility there that makes her seem human. I don't even know if I'd call it fragility. It's just uh, she wants human things, but in an inhuman way. Yeah, like even with the way Enchantress kind of gets into her head, like that was not expecting or that was not what I would be expecting her to be wanting. Well, and it really I think it. I don't want to spoil too much about specifically about the end of the movie, but she does something at the end of the movie where the fact that she's such a loose cannon, you like you buy that she's the person who could pull that off because you don't know what she's going to do. Yeah. And so it makes sense that the other characters wouldn't know what she was going to do either. Yeah. It's definitely a like hold your breath moment because you could see her doing exactly what she intended to do. Right. You don't even know for sure if she starts out like, again, I'm being very vague, but she does something and you think like going out of it afterwards, I thought, did she start out thinking like, yes, this is exactly what I'm going to do and change her mind halfway through just because she's that crazy? Or was it the plan all along? I mean, the, the, the boring answer is that it was the plan all along, but I really want to believe that she she could just flip on a dime like that. And, and you by that because of how how well she's played yeah like she almost was like she was flipping and then she saw like an opportunity to do the other thing she's like oh i like this idea better (laughs) and that's exactly her character and you know to a lesser extent i'd say uh will smith not that he's not will smith just brings the charisma in giant charisma bags he just rolled up (laughs) and like unpacked his charisma suitcase and said okay guys here i am they also made deadshot a lot more fun to watch than i expected him to be well here's it's not just the charisma it's also his abilities like maybe it's a little bit can seeing him hit the same like target in the same spot over and over and over again in his little like uh bringing him back out montage but like whenever he's up on the car and just like laying waste to people it's a lot of fun to watch that scene was so good you really got the sense of like the the perspective the way that the other soldiers look at him in that moment you and you understand oh he's doing something that's incredible right now when he just stands up on that car and mows down everybody yeah you've got six navy seals basically just like stopping to watch I thought one of the best things that they did in this movie was they had a really great balance of the other characters in this movie, the antagonists, not just the antagonists as in like the big bads, but the other people that are around the Suicide Squad are bad also, but not yeah. <laughs> in a like not in a weird comic booky way. Like they're in prison and the guards are all douchebags, but in a way that you would actually expect prison cards to be douchebaggy. Yeah, and, where it's kind of like there's there's almost camaraderie with the people in the prison, but it's still like they still have to assert themselves at times. Right. And Amanda Waller is just like chillingly, uh, I, I want to say evil, but again, she's got that. It's just enough where you can see like, yes, there's something under there that, you know, she's got a, a a moral, not a moral center, a principled center. Let's say she she yeah, believes she's doing things principled. for the right reason, even if she's just killing people off left and right. And there's so, only one spot where I felt like they went too far with her. Really? Was it in the office building? Yeah, I like thought that I've, was perfect. That was my favorite scene with her. I was like, oh, now I understand what this person is. Now I really I get, like they hint, you know, you sort of can buy into her as maybe she's a pretty okay person. You know, she's doing kind of jerky things, but she's got to be mean. And then you're like, oh, no, she's just completely <laughs> ruthless. I think it was just hard for me to go with the idea that Rick Flagg would just be okay with what he just saw. Um, again, like, so I, it's it's not like it broke it. It was just it was one of the it was a very jarring moment to me. And it was supposed to be. Well, I think the idea is that a lot of these people are broken, but so, so you have this contrast, you have these suicide squad who they never, the the fear is that they're going to turn these guys into good guys and you want to be sympathetic with them on some level, but you also don't want them to stop being villains. And especially with people like Harley Quinn, um, you don't, and Captain Boomerang, you don't want to go into the, oh, but really deep down they have a good heart. Yeah, uh, and there's only like you could only really say that about Deadshot, I think. Oh, they, you could definitely say it about El Diablo. 
Yeah, Diablo I, is trying, but he like at his core, he still hurt a lot of people and very intentionally at times. Well, he so, does. Uh, I, I think that he, his arc is that he was evil and now he's in prison because of that. And he's trying to sort of put that behind him and reconcile the two halves. The, the, there's a lot of variation. There's a really great sort of weird rainbow of moral shades. You know, Deadshot is totally fine killing people, but he's got his moral center. El Diablo has gone full on pacifist. He's like, no, we're not. Th- this is not going to happen again. And, you know, he lets them. Which, to a point, that's good because they need to actually have a fight because all Diablo shows up and just everything goes away. Um, (laughs) But he lets them get into a lot of fights and doesn't want to help because he's got his whole pacifism come to Jesus thing going. And, you know, then you get Deadshot, who's fine killing people, but, you know, he really wants to impress his daughter. He wants to sort of show her that he, underneath it all, is not a giant douchebag. I like that he kind of doesn't exactly know how either. Like he's trying to buy her stuff and trying to make up for things, but like he, he's also having some moments with her, but she's still not quite on his side. It, it was seemed like a very complicated relationship that they were able to show in just a few quick scenes. And, you know, and then you get to captain boomerang. Who's just like, he's kind of psychotic. But not like not on Harley Quinn's level. He just doesn't care what happens to anybody else. And he's going to steal stuff. And yet somehow Jai Courtney pulls off the performance of his lifetime, especially after having watched Terminator Genesis or whatever they called that. Holy crap. It was not good in that movie, you guys. But he nails this character uh, with just the right amount of weird fun. And yet, again, you never... There's never a point where you can be like, oh, man, Captain Boomerang is a good guy. He's not a good guy. Yeah. But they like, managed to make him fun to watch. They like they they even explain that he's net like he never works well with other people. He's always trying to manipulate others. He's he's doing all of that. And like you're still kind of smiling while you're watching him do it, especially when he does. Uh, what was it? Slipknot? Oh, Slipknot. By the way, what a just a waste of. Like it was a, that was a weird storytelling decision. So this will be a little bit of a spoiler. Slipknot shows up and five minutes later, he's killed. Like everybody else gets their own long intro section. Slipknot does not. Slipknot, <laughs> whose power is apparently that he's sort of like Spider-Man, but without the superpowers. Like he just has mechanic stuff that does that. Um, he, he just shows up in the middle. That's one of the many arguably missteps uh, that the movie has, but it, it almost felt like David Ayer was like, all right, we've got this pile of villains that we can choose from. Who's the dumbest, most expendable villain that nobody will miss? And then they made him the big bad and Slipknot was the second on that list. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, I don't even remember that villains, the, the the big bad, the main guy, Enchantress's brother. Do you even remember his name? Because I've read it and I re- they said it in the movie like once. I don't remember the name and... He's he turns more into like a henchman, like really, he's yeah. just a big guy and like there to fight El Diablo and he, everybody else. And he it's, didn't need to be there. He yeah. didn't like from a story point of view, that dude is a waste of space. The only thing he does is give El Diablo somebody to fight at the end. Um, And that I thought was just it. It didn't feel like economical storytelling. Yeah. And Plus, don't get me wrong. I had a lot of fun with that particular fight. Oh, that, but was, but that fight was great. Not yeah. to go into, I don't, I, that is something I will definitely not spoil, but that fight kicks off. Yeah. It's, it was a, it was a fantastic moment. It was just a little bit overshadowed by like, who is this guy and why should I care type thing? Although that fight does kind of highlight one of the other problems that I have with the movie in that these people are going up against gods, essentially. And yeah, it's like Aztec gods or Mayan gods. I'm not sure which. I think it was Aztec. I don't remember exactly where they were from, but generic Central American God is probably closer to what, (laughs) but 90% of the team. I mean, I don't calculate that percentage, but other than El Diablo, (laughs) nobody has superpowers like Killer Croc is kind of strong and his skin is kind of tough. So and he can swim underwater for a good long while. Right. I mean, I'm not saying that's not a superpower, but Compared to these godlike beings, n- nobody can take them. They're completely, basically invincible to the team. And that created a really weird balancing act. I felt like one of the f- things this movie didn't do well was showing these people 
and maybe they do, maybe the point is that they don't ever really fight as a team, but they just I compare it and granted this is the gold standard, but you go back to civil war and that fight at the airport and how much it really gave everybody a chance to shine because everybody has their own thing, right? Everybody has their own superpower here. It's just, well, here's Deadshot with a gun and here's Harley Quinn with either a gun or a bat. And here's captain boomerang with either a gun or a boomerang. And they're just, everybody's either hitting people or shooting people. There's no difference there. And one of the problems I had with that is, it felt like they weren't the team to go combat a full on existential world ending threat. And whenever you don't have that sort of power, I feel like you almost have to like, you have to localize it a little bit. You have to have it be based on wants, desires and a very, uh, very focused villain. Like you look at daredevil or some of the other ones where it's not a world ending problem. It's just a very specific set of problems that they're trying to solve. And I kind of wish they would have kept it on that more of a local level. Well, and that's kind of where I come back to Captain Boomerang being the film's mascot, because Captain Boomerang has no reason to be there. Like of of all the people, he's just he doesn't he's not even that good with a boomerang. OK, he doesn't <laughs> do hardly any fancy tricks with the boomerang. Well, the, he's just an annoying that, Aussie. Yeah, he's an annoying Aussie who's good at stealing stuff. Um, like, but you don't mind in him the, Go ahead. was like they said he held his own against the flash but they never showed you that and it seemed like the flash just kind of took him out yeah what did who said he tell, held i didn't even hear that line did amanda someone, waller said that she was like he held his own against a meta human like the flash okay well it would have been great to see that uh, yeah. you know instead of amanda waller expo- <laughs> expositing everything about the movie there uh, is some expositing around this movie it's it <laughs> there's a lot of info dumps not quite as much as Dune. Let that that's our most recent <laughs> podcast, by the way. This is way better than Dune, in my opinion. More fun at least. Um but yeah, even though he doesn't make any sense, that he doesn't need to be there, he's still you're never thinking like, I wish I wasn't watching this idiot. Yeah. Because he's doing his thing with a pink unicorn and uh you know, you know, grabbing a beer every chance he gets. And he's got weird eye makeup on for some reason, even though I can never imagine a person like that potentially intentionally putting on makeup, but sure. And like, I felt like the beer thing was definitely something that he would do while he's out. Oh, definitely. That that was, (laughs) that is not out of character. Yeah. Just little character things that made him fleshed out without having to have the giant expository moments. I felt like that the one character that was really underserved was killer croc. Although he did get yeah. a few good moments towards the end, but he does. The it. only problem I had with him is like his head is just a little weirdly proportionate to the body. I, I thought that was amazing. I thought that honestly, I thought that there was just a lot of really great special or uh, like practical effects in this. Well, like the way his face moved and everything, you could tell they put a lot of effort into making that mask perfect instead of going CGI. And there's Which another I appreciate it. Th- there's a lot of these sets where these monsters have been and they've blasted through and like things are like Spiky molten steel has been splattered backwards and then frozen. And the way the camera moves on that, you you see that like, oh, they actually built a lot of this. And there those sets and things are I thought were really, really effective. You know, yeah. what wasn't effective in this movie or even needed was the Joker. Yeah, I figured we were going to have the Joker conversation here soon. And part of me really didn't like what they did with him because you're talking about a guy who's a sociopath that often scares the crap out of Harley Quinn, especially in like the killing joke. And like he's just like head over heels in love. And it just felt like if he's actually a sociopath, he wouldn't be feeling these things. He would be trying to possess her more than anything else. I, and that she would be kind of bought into that. But at the same time, I actually kind of bought that he really, really did like her in that way. I thought that I, it was interesting that they made him. I mean, and it's almost hard not to if you got Jared Leto, but that that this Joker is a very sexualized Joker, not in the sense that he's walking around in leather pants or anything, but he he feel like the Heath Leather Joker never felt like somebody who would, you know, need that. Or be yeah. interested in that. And this Joker not only feel, you know, needs that, but he uses that. You know, he's got that weird scene with the guy who he's trying to get information out of. And he just like sits on his lap and kind of using that weird, bizarre sexual energy as an as an offensive weapon. And I kind yeah, of dug that. It, 
it's a little closer to like a David Bowie type Joker than like the Heath Ledger. Yeah. And so that that worked for me. But the the idea of him just being kind of ultimately a scumbag crime boss, like he's not he's just has his gang wear silly outfits and stuff. But we don't understand what is different about this guy than any other mafia dude who just wants to get his girlfriend back. Yeah, because a lot of it is like him hanging out in clubs and driving expensive cars and things like that. And that didn't feel like it quite fit with the Joker, except for the fact that you could have a lot of chaos and fun with those sorts of toys. But I'm wondering how much different he'll be. I'm assuming he's going to be the bad guy in the in the Batman movie coming out. But we'll have to wait and see for that. Yeah, I, it, I'm glad I'm they didn't make him the main bad guy in this, but I almost yeah. don't feel like. He d- yeah. you could cut him out of this plot. You can do an edit of this movie where the Joker does not exist. And I don't think you would really have to change anything as far as the story goes. Yeah, you'd have like you'd be cutting out a few parts for Harley Quinn and her character. But like we already had enough established for her that we wouldn't be losing a lot. Right. But ultimately, despite the fact that, again, structurally, it's kind of a mess. There's some weird editing stuff. And I heard uh, through the grapevine, I'm not sure how much of this is true, but that Warner Brothers actually like uh, took the edit away from David Ayer and gave it to the people who cut the trailers, which I thought was a weird thing. And watching the beginning of the movie with that in mind, I was thinking this really feels like a trailer cut of all of these scenes. Uh, It seemed like that there was a lot of sloppier storytelling where they they were going they felt like oh we have to establish these people and they didn't ha- weren't able to do it in an organic way yeah there were a lot of the things that i was reading on reddit and from various critics was that they should have just tossed us in the middle of it and had the characters kind of working together for a little bit we didn't need to see the giant establishing of suicide squad and everything else especially like, cuz it doesn't make any sense like ultimately the the suicides uh, amanda waller is ultimately the cause of the problem yeah (laughs) like if she wasn't messing around with all this crap that they wouldn't have had to go and do the thing that they had to go and do so i will say that it actually kind of justifies justice league more than i expected it to yeah literally you did you stay for the mid cut yeah yeah yeah, i did although i felt like really we needed to know where batman got the folder great that's i don't know (laughs) okay I think it was more showing that Batman was just like, he knows what she did. He knows like exactly what happened in Midtown and was basically like, you know what? I've got this. Like, go ahead and get rid of your stupid suicide squad. It didn't work out for you, even though it kind of worked out. I well, I hope they don't get rid of the, the movies. I would like yeah. to see more with these characters, especially, you know, Deadshot and Captain Boomerang and Harley Quinn. I don't know how they're going to get. Well, uh, there, there's some sort of loose ends at the end of this one that I would wonder how they would pull back together if they got the same team. But I, I liked it enough to want them to take another stab. I would really like them to maybe do a little more work on the story. You guys like, let's, let's maybe have a finished script before we start shooting. Yeah. Cause that's something else I heard six weeks on the script. And that's just not enough time for a blockbuster $250 million movie. Like you, you should probably be working on that for like six months with multiple writers to get it right. So I, it's, it's a weird thing to come out of cause I didn't love the movie and there's a lot of stuff I can point to as criticisms, but I, the great moments were really great and yeah. the character moments were really great. And so I, I almost I feel like I need to recommend this, whereas Batman v Superman, I just felt like, oh, this is a slog and it's so long. I mean, I think they were actually similar lengths, but uh, and it wasn't just the fun. I felt like this one was put together just slightly better. And I think more to anything, the characters got a better chance to be who they who they were. And and of course, you don't have to worry about being them being mischaracterized as bad guys because they are bad guys. Yeah. (laughs) There was a, I think there was a little bit of freedom for David Ayer there to just experiment and try things. He said that he wanted to make his movie and that they pretty much let him until the, until the end, whatever the cuts started coming and they started doing some reshoots. But I think that might've been more on the whole, like we have to make this work. We have to make this be our Deadpool and all that. It felt like 
a lot. Some of it was trying to have some Marvel moments. And I don't think that's as a fan of many Marvel movies. I didn't feel like that was a bad thing. I feel like that they understand on the surface what those moments are. And that's a good start. I don't think they really have grasped the Marvel formula of story and kind of getting the core of things right. So, yeah, I think that goes back to just vision. Like Zack Snyder does not have the overall vision that who is it like Feige or whatever? Uh, Kevin like, Feige, Feige is the uh, he's like the uh, not the CEO, but the create the director of uh, all of Marvel Studios. He doesn't. He's a producer. Sorry. Um, whereas WB actually has. Kevin Fujihara or Sujihara, I'm sorry, as their producer who I've read recently was put in that position without any prior experience with making stories, movie type things. Like he, yeah. he was just a transplant CEO from another successful company. And they're like, Hey, it go come on our shows. movie company. Um, and whereas he, you've got like Joss Whedon and like Feige and all these other people working in conjunction to make a giant overall story of where all the movies fit into each other. It feels like Justice League just doesn't quite have that. Like they, they're like, we have to copy. We have to make this. We have, like we have to do this for DC. But they didn't take the time to really build the giant overarching story. Like and it doesn't feel like they have the a singular Infinity vision. Gauntlet. It feels yeah. like they're still reacting and still like, oh, well, we got to figure out, uh, oh, they didn't like not enough fun. Uh, put more fun in, guys. <laughs> uh, that I know that there are that that might have already been in the Suicide Squad, but it does seem Warner Brothers seems like the more reactionary studio rather than somebody who's like, all right, we have this vision. This is where we're going and understands how to bring that to pass rather than just let's throw $150 million at this and a lot of advertising money and put our, you know, Batman in it and people will come see it. You got to do, you got to do more than that guys. You did, you have an okay. Okay. You have like a base hit with suicide squad, not a home run, but it gets you on base. It's not the, in my opinion, the strikeout that Batman be Superman was, but it, I was, it does I was not thinking that same analogy while I was in the theater. I was like, all right, so Superman was more like a foul ball. BVS was a full on strike. And if they strike out with this one, they're going to have some real issues. So I'm still looking for that home run, that movie that I can come out of and be like, oh, yeah, everything was awesome with that. I haven't seen that movie yet, but Suicide Squad is a step in the right direction. (sighs) Is that it for us, Tony? That's 30 minutes. That's how long we talk. Yep, I think that's it for me. Like, uh, my last little complaint is that they went a little over CG with Enchantress whenever she was like the full on god mode. Otherwise, yeah, they I did thought that, she was they did really that cool. Toro thing where she's like, they have the actress, like, they actually filmed the actress in the outfit and like the weird skin and everything, which looked cool. And then, like, they threw 800 particle effects at her, uh, layered on top of that and made it just look weird. Yeah. Whereas whenever she was kind of lights out style, like dark enchantress, she looked really cool. And it was just like a little bit of like mist off of her and and like the whole magic thing and all that, that it was weird seeing them talk about magic in a universe that's mostly been based on like on technology. I guess it's not really technology for uh, Superman. It's just weird seeing so much magic being talked about in these movies, like same with Scarlet Witch coming out. So I don't know. Odd thoughts on that. I still recommend going and seeing it. Like, I'm wondering if it's going to make the 400 million it needs to be able to break even. I predict that it will, Tony. Yeah. So we'll see how it does uh, and see if that IMDb rating and that Rotten Tomatoes rating goes up. Thank you guys very much for listening. Uh, If I could have you go to humanechoes.com and check out some of our other content. We've got some amazing stuff there as well as our bonus podcast. And you can, if you become a member, you get access to that bonus podcast, $2, $5, $10, $20 a month. Any of those tiers will give you the bonus podcast along with really cool extras. Uh, Also, uh, just go ahead and subscribe to this podcast. If you don't have money to pay us for any of this, uh, leave us a review, leave us a tweet, leave us a retweet, anything like that. It just really helps us out. And we'll see you guys next week with a regularly scheduled podcast that comes out on Friday. Have a good one, you guys. Bye. Bye.